Hey guys, it's Morgan. I am on the porch and I've just been sitting here reflecting on how special this series really is to me. I started my nonprofit organization a few years ago, all with the goal of being able to properly, professionally, and intentionally interview survivors from communist countries because I'm just really concerned. I saw the statistics about people my age supporting socialism and even communism at dangerous levels. A majority of people my age actually would choose that over economic independence right now. And I decided to start this and I've been working years to get to this point, the Freedom Records, because now we have this amazing professional team, an amazing set at American Journey Experience. And to kick it off right, there was really no other way to do this than by starting with Shiva and Fleet. If you're unaware of she, she's a concerned mom from Loudoun County, Virginia. That's been a hot place these days. But originally, she is from communist China. If you're unfamiliar with the history of communist China, Mao Zedong, a communist dictator, rose up to power by promising empowerment of the people, empowerment of the working class. And eventually, things got a little chaotic. And so a second revolution of communist China had to happen, and it was called the Cultural Revolution where Mao worked to remove the four olds of communist China. So old ideas, old customs, old habits, and old culture. To implement this, he had a little red book and he made everybody read it. And to carry out the beliefs of the little red book, he trained up what was called the Red Guard. And this was just a handful of decades ago. Shi Van Fleet, she became very concerned as she saw the similar tactics and the similar messaging coming from the American left. She specifically was very worried about what was going on in American schools. So as a concerned mom in Loudoun County, she was inspired, I think she's specifically inspired by Dan Bongino is what she said, who told all of his audience that everybody has a specific way, a small way even, of standing up and having a positive impact to save the country. And so she was inspired and she went as a concerned mom to speak at the school board meeting. That speech went viral. And from there, she became an activist, a public speaker, and continues to educate everyone, connecting the past to present, just like we try to do with our interviews. So I'm very honored that we were able to interview her at our studio. And I'm very excited for you guys to get to hear her life story and her lessons that she has for Americans of all ages. I hope you learn a great amount from she, and I hope you enjoy the first episode of the Freedom Records. Thank you so much. More developments tonight on how parents and common sense Americans are pushing back against the destructive far left critical race theory ideology that's infiltrating America's schools. Just listen to how one Virginia mom who actually survived Mao China eviscerates her local school board amid the district's critical race theory push. Take a look at this. Uh, growing up in Mao China, all this seemed very familiar. The uh, communist regime used the same critical theory to divide people. The only difference is they use class instead of race. During the Cultural Revolution, I witnessed students and teachers that can turn against each other. We changed school names to be politically correct. Um, we were taught to denounce our heritage. The Red Guards destroy anything that is not communist. Old uh, statues, books, and anything else. <clears throat> we are also encouraged to report on each other, just like the uh, Student Equity Ambassador Program, and the Bias Reporting System. This is indeed the American version of the Chinese Communist, the Chinese Cultural Revolution. The critical race theory has its roots in cultural Marxism. It should have no place in our schools. She, you decided to get up and do something, not just talk about it. Sadly, you have experience with this kind of indoctrination before in schools, and you said, no, not today, not on my watch. Well, I have been uh, really paying close attention to what's going on in America. And I said, this is it. This is cultural revolution. I experienced when I was 
a little girl in China, and I have to do something. I cannot believe we got you in person. Thank you so much to invite me all the way to Dallas. <laughs> I, I've been looking forward to this. Most people have seen that video that I know. They're aware of that you know, infamous speech that you gave. That was a surprise that, uh, a, a total shock to me that my video went viral. And uh, so uh, uh, two days later, when Fox News called, I was terrified <laughs> because I thought I was just going there um, as, a, uh, as a resident of Loudoun County to express my opinion. And uh, um, I thought that's local and that's the end of it. But well, that's not meant to be. So now after um, Fox News, it become national. So, and I just welcomed it. So I have been going around the country and uh, speaking uh, to uh, um, group of, different group of people and events and interviews. So why I'm doing this, I want to send, sound alarm to American people. What's going on here in America is the replay of what I experienced as a young girl in China during the Cultural Revolution. Well, thank you for doing that. Um, let's get into that. A lot of people, I'm sure you know this, the public education system doesn't really do a good job of explaining what happened in communist China when it first especially came to power. Um, can you give us a, a brief background on what the Cultural Revolution was and perhaps how it was the second revolution uh, under Mao? I, um, I started tweeting not too long ago, but uh, just uh, last week, I got this comment on my tweet. This, uh, this person said, um, in school, he never learned about Cultural Revolution, never learned what communists did, all he learned is slavery and the Nazi. And someone else said, and I remember learning something about MacArthurism. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. It is a major problem of um, our educational system um, because uh, people do not know what communism is. That's why when it come, landed in our front door, people could not recognize it. They have no idea. What's going on today here is communism. So what happened with the Cultural Revolution in oh, China yes, that we should have question. learned? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. That's a, a, it's a big question. And there's a lot of information about it. I'm just going to simplify. Yeah. Okay. Mao had his first revolution. And that's the Communist Revolution to take over China. And uh, that's 1949. Okay. 17 years later, he launched this his second revolution. That's the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Why? Because during the past 17 years, Mao launched one political campaign after another. One of them was called Great, Great Leap Forward. And during that campaign, um, he uh, implemented radical policies that ended up um, this greed famine that killed up to four, uh, 40 million Chinese. And what were those policies? Was it government takeover of the yeah, farms? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a collective farming. And um, that's another episode about yeah, that. Yeah. But anyway. But it's important to understand, like, a lot of the times when we try and explain what socialism is, and it's the government taking over these absolutely. major industries, they say, oh, no, it's community ownership or the mm. people own it. Can you just briefly touch on that? Of, okay. It's the government ruining it. And it's the state mm -hmm. and the uh, commune, which is a collective farming. Basically, is a, the state take back all the land. And then so they call it commune, share. Sounds very, very nice. Everyone has a share of it which means no one owns anything. The state has ownership of everything in China, not only land, but uh, property, factory. And uh, so that is uh, the, uh, uh, the, re uh, the uh, motivation for the uh, uh, campaign. But the result, it's always, they say it's for sharing, right? The result is uh, um, famine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so because of that, um, 40 million people, I was too little 
to, uh, I was in that time, um, I born just about that time, but I don't remember. Yeah. And uh, the, um, uh, my, my personal experience, I, I can't remember. But everybody went hungry, but it was the peasants that, who died. Okay, so after that, um, in the party, within the CCP party, um, a lot of people start to question Mao's um, authority. And uh, actually, he was sidelined a little bit, and uh, he doesn't like it. He did not like it. And so he uh, waited and uh, figured out the way to come back, to get uh, the power back. And uh, that's the reason he launched the Cultural Revolution. He wanted to seize power from behind, uh, for, 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 from below, from his own party. Mm. From so it's a it is a culture it is a revolution to overthrow the CCP. Interesting. Very interesting, and so that is the reason. And what is it? It's chaos, total chaos. The goal was to take back power from the CCP bureaucrats. Those were in power, but Mao think they were not loyal to him. But how how did he do it? Red Guards. We can talk a, a little more in detail later, yeah. but it's the Red Guards, the young people, the indoctrinated people did the dirty work. And so what they did is they destroyed, in the process, they destroyed Chinese traditional culture, Chinese civilization. They destroyed the economy. They divided the country into like, a, like family, friends, neighbors all become enemy of each other. And then up to 20 people killed in the process. By the time Mao died, China was in the brink of total collapse. The Cultural Re Revolution ended because Mao died. Wow. Okay, so how old were you when he died? When he died, I was 16. Okay. So when the Cultural Revolution started, I was six turning seven. Can you maybe give us a, a give us your story of what it was like to come of age yeah. in the Cultural Revolution? Okay, so um, um, I think your, uh, your original question is, uh, um, when did I notice that things are off, yeah. right? Yeah. It's not off. It was like a tornado hit the nation. And you and noticed as a child? Yeah, and I seriously can't remember anything before that. What I learned in school, I do remember, but not much, because that was eventless in, com in comparison to what uh, came later. And uh, to me, my earliest memory, overnight, absolutely overnight, um, that I saw the uh, big character posters posted everywhere. And what is that? It is like a big piece of paper, and uh, they wrote in the brush, big character, um, so that everyone can see it's on the wall. And it's kind of today's social media for everyone to see. And I was too little to uh, really understand what's uh, written there. But there are a lot of cartoon pictures to go with the posters. So I know from those pictures, they're about denunciation of teachers, and administrators, and I could figure out. And so everyone to read, school stopped. And then... So the posters attacked the teachers? Teachers and, and educators? And, and, and possibly each other. And said, stop schooling. School stopped. And so eventually it became physical. And so the students would target teachers. Those are little kids, elementary school kids. So they were target teachers. I remember there was one petite little uh, 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 teacher, kind of like you, very small. <laughs> and she just liked to uh, make herself attractive. And she would do a little thing, nothing major, maybe a little hair or little things to her hair. She was considered bourgeois. And a student, just one day I witnessed that. They uh, surrounded her and father called her name is eventually spit on her. So she was just covered with spit. And there were some other things uh, going on. And the teacher 
who could not have her own children adopted a, a, a girl. For whatever reason, the students say she exploited a helpless orphan. So they attacked her, raided her home, and, uh, and, and I remember, I will never forget, that the mother was taken away by the little, little red guards, little kids, and she was left there crying. And so that was nothing, because that was elementary school. Those little kids in what? high school and college, they beat their uh, teachers and professors and killed many of them. And so that was the first two, three years. Violence, violence, no school, and we're just free to go. And every day we would go out what we saw. We never uh, have to worry, nothing to do. There's always things to see. It's the struggle session. Have you heard about that? Yeah, they had them in Cambodia as well. Yeah, struggle session as whoever they pick as the one to be to denounce, we'll have parade, we'll have like public trials. And so every day we will see something going on. And, uh, and eventually, eventually it becomes so violent, the uh, red guards start to fight each other and it was dangerous. And one day um, there was a bullet uh, hit just a little bit before, uh, below our window. And it's kind of a straight bullet. And uh, if it's just a little bit higher or hit our room, who knows? One of us may get hurt. It's just total chaos. That lasted uh, about three years. And then when school uh, re um, reopened, I was in fourth grade and uh, all the old textbooks were banned. We have no tech, new textbooks were not ready. So for like a year or so, all we had his mouth's a little red book. That's all we did. We read it, and uh, that's not enough. And they made it, uh, it's just a little quotation of Mao. Yeah. Many of them were made into songs. So we sang the quotation. We read, uh, recite the quotation. I remember those quotations. I could not get out of my mind because they take my, uh, uh, my memory uh, space because that's all we learned for more than a year, that's it. Wow. And eventually, we got new uh, textbook. That's all uh, political size textbook. I remember when I was in fifth grade, we started to learn English. Before, it was Russian. And then the Russian uh, relation goes sour. So it's English. I was so excited. This, the first chapter of our English book. What? Long live Chairman Mao. <laughs> and then the other things I learned from my first year uh, English, um, long live Chairman Mao, proletarian, dictatorship. I said, this is so hard, the English is so hard. We use all those terms that really was not useful to learn a language, bourgeois. I said, this is difficult. All those are part of the uh, text uh, lessons because it's all political slogans. So really learned nothing when I graduated um, in 1975. We have, there's nothing for us. The, all the Red Guards were sent to the countryside. So, uh, so were the uh, young people that graduated like me. So I was sent to the countryside to work with uh, the peasants in the fields. So, don't think about when, when I say countryside, you think about the pretty countryside here in America. No, this is really primitive, hard work and uh, um, with the peasants and uh, almost like exile. So I worked there for three years. And how old were you when you went? 16. You were taken from your family? Yeah, everyone had to do that. So uh, fortunately, Mao died. Thank God he died. And then the uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, took over and he was a reformer. So he said, we have, we can't go on like this. We have to stop and then reopen college and universities. And during the Cultural Revolution, you go to university with this Chinese affirmative action. You have to be read. And I'm going to explain that first. That means you have to come from a good family, red family, 
and you have to uh, have good behavior and, uh, and recommended by party leaders. So no academic requirement. That's what's during the Cultural Revolution. And Deng Xiaoping said, now we open it for people to take examinations. You go to college based on your own ability. I did that. Mm. And I was able to go to college okay. And at the age of 19. And what did you study? English. <laughs> yeah, so after that, I worked uh, as a um, teacher in a teacher training college for three years. And I met an American teacher who came to teach in our college during the summer and made friends with someone who determined to help me to come here. So three years later, I landed. Wow. in America. Wow. So I'm curious that that American teacher, did mm. they know what they were getting themselves into by going to communist China? Um, by then, China started to open and they were organized by churches. So it's usually like a 30 of them, they were come to teach um, in for the summer. Those are the days when we see hope. We see China started to open to the world and I could even talk to Americans first hand. And I remember there was one young lady, she, uh, she immigrated from uh, Hong Kong to America. So I said, how is it uh, living in America? She said, I will never forget. She said, America is the greatest country in the world. Anyone can go there and, uh, and uh, make a life for themselves. And there's no one uh, discriminate against you just because you are Chinese or just because I said I really really want to go there and, uh, and, and that's she is so right and that is so true this is the least racist country in the world Wow how old were you when you got here 27 uh, 26 and what was that like um, that's another long story <laughs> I have to say that uh, in the beginning it's in my mind, this is a country um, of freedom, uh, uh, of plenty. So I did not pay much attention to anything else. I just focused on achieving my American dream. And it's very narrow. It's all kind of materialistic. I said, I have to get a degree, I have to get a job, I have to get a green car, I have to stay, and uh, and then have to buy a house, get a career, have a family, and it all realized perfectly. And uh, until probably more than a decade ago, I start to see dangerous signs. The signs that remind me of cultural revolution and get worse and worse until 2020. And it's no longer signs. It's full blowing cultural revolution. What I saw, what everybody saw on TV, of the uh, BMM, Antifa, burning our cities, terrorizing our communities, that's Red Guard. Yeah. I said, I cannot stay silent anymore. And as an Asian Im immigrant, we are mostly very quiet. It's just part of the culture. We learned very young age, do not, um, the, the, uh, the lesson that my parents or every parent teach their children is disaster come out of your mouth. Just be quiet, don't say anything, and you'll be safe. And that's what uh, I learned. But now I can't stay um, quiet because I do not want to live under communism again. That's the reason I finally got involved and went to school board and made that speech. <laughs> well, I'm glad you did. Now, it, let's transition into what I love that you talk about, because I've been doing this on college campuses. I go to college campuses, especially before COVID, and mm -hmm. I would talk about the tactics of the left. And then I saw on YouTube, when I was looking into you, when we were preparing for this, that you have speeches where you talk about the tactics of the radical left in America mm -hmm. and Mao's China. Um, do you want to start with the Red Guard? Can we talk about w what happened there where he actually trained up the youth to be the militant activist group that did his dirty work. Okay, so when the Chinese communists took over China in 1949, one of the first thing they did is take over education mm -hmm. because they understand it is very important. What they did is they gathered all the school teachers 
and professors, but mainly school teachers, and give them intensive training because those teachers were teachers of the old China. Mm -hmm. They learned the old stuff. No, 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 that has to be get rid of. They gave them training, like intensive day and night. They have to pass uh, the examination before they could go back to the classroom to teach. Teach what? Teach Marxism and communism values. And so from day one, they took control of uh, education system for one reason, run that reason only, to indoctrinate the children and the future uh, children. So textbooks were, of course, have to be re redo. Uh, no, they will read the, the textbook, and, uh, and, and that's the, the beginning of rewrite history, absolutely rewrite history and, uh, and inject politics, Marxist ideology in everything, including math. Everything. Math? Math, everything. And especially in the Cultural Revolution. Actually, I tweeted, I found some uh, uh, math textbook pages on the on, on, uh, internet, and I, I tweeted it. And it's, it's things like uh, Uncle Liu uh, was a poor peasant. He worked for the land owner, the oppressor. He worked like uh, three acres of land. He did this and that, and then he gave, the, uh, in the end of the year, he had to give this much grain to the landlord. Question, huh? how many grain the landowner exploited from Uncle Liu? This is oh, typical. Exploited from the worker. Yeah, from the I worker. See. And everything is like that. Yeah. And, and you, you can't just do a simple math. You can't just say apple, no, 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 yeah. no. It has to be it's in, class struggle. Now, are you shocked, or I guess not shocked at all, are you worried considering the critical race theory? People exactly. are putting that into American questions That's now? the thing. That's the repeat. They're sneaking it into how they phrase yes. questions, ask things. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. I didn't know that they did that, too. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, thank God that my father saved everything. My father just saved paper, family paper, everything. Wow. And I brought some here. And just a few days ago, I was going through the paper and found the first evaluation I ever got when I was three is from a preschool. Hmm. And there is a one uh, section of the uh, in, uh, evaluation, evaluation is uh, moral development. So as a three-year-old little girl, it said, she understands, she knows that our great leader is Chairman Mao. And that she understands that Chairman Mao loves his little children and we should all be Chairman Mao's good little children. At age of three, they started. They probably started even earlier, yeah. but that's the earliest evaluation paper I got. And they start documenting it even. Yes, oh and gosh. then later on, I can see that when I was five, she, and something like that, she understand that uh, we are in a war with the American imperialists in Korea. Oh my gosh. Like four years, three year old. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, that's this, they waste no time. Yeah. Absolutely no time. So that's how they, uh, they could get the, uh, the red guard. So from earlier on, we were taught that um, the party and Chairman Mao was our real parents, not your own parents. Your parents gave birth to you, mm -hmm. but your real parents are the party and Chairman Mao. Would they directly say that? Oh, uh, no, that's not direct, direct say. We are taught that we sing songs. Mm -hmm. And one of the songs is, uh, uh, Father is dear, mother is dear, neither is as dear as Chairman Mao. And they're still singing it today. Wow. Still singing it today. So loyalty to the party, to Mao, come before the family. So during the Cultural Revolution, it's no surprise. Cultural Revolution was just a perfect uh, uh, example that we can have what those indoctrinated kids can do. So in, uh, because Mao wanted to uh, seize power from below, so he wanted a mass movement to regain the power. So uh, who, who can you call first? Those little good children. Those are the little uh, red guards. And so he gave them full support. That you have to really understand. How could those little uh, kids 
you know, 14, 16, oldest probably just 18. How could they do what they did? Because Mao uh, supported them. Mao supported them openly and everyone knew it. So actually I was reading um, a book by an American Red Guard. He was the first American citizen to join the CCP what? and stayed there. Yeah, his name is Sidney Rittenberg. He was a Red Guard and he had uh, in, in, in his book, he recall seeing those red guards ran, ransack the busiest shopping district in Beijing, tear down the street, uh, uh, the uh, store names and signs and whatever, and just breaking everything, whatever. He said, those are little kids. Everyone could just stop them. He said, stop, you can't do this, but no one, did that, and everyone obeyed their command. Why? Because everyone knew Mao is behind him, behind them. That's the same question we should ask. Really, we could not stop those BMM and Antifa because someone is behind them. Yeah, and they were. I mean, yeah, the, absolutely. the top national politicians in America yeah, supported absolutely. the rioting, the, looting, absolutely. helped them get out of jail. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay, so, what I'm curious about, I always misunderstand the connection. So when did he say, we're going to send all of the older children out to the countryside to get trained up to truly become this Red Guard? What was that like? No, that, that's a little, um, okay, let me explain. Yeah. Um, so the Red Guards basically carry out Mao's order. So in the beginning, it was like a change of school names, street names, store names and uh, personal names to be politically correct. They just did the, uh, exactly what the Red Guards here did. Torn down statues, smash the uh, Buddhist uh, statues, burn down the temples, and, uh, and ran a sack or raid people's homes. And, uh, but eventually, they start to kill people. And uh, this is very, very important to, to know. It's, they're not just, really just not, Monsters, they were little kids. And the first killing was done in Beijing in 1966 by a group of young girls, young girls, 15, 16. What they did is uh, they got their principal, uh, assistant principal out, because she supposedly, according to Mao, is uh, the uh, bourgeois intellectual authority that need, they need to be overthrown. So they got her out and they beat her with stick, with nails, pour boiling water on her, and she was killed by a bunch of young girls. The indoctrination can turn just ordinary girls into monsters. That's the power of in, uh, uh, um, indoctrination. Wow. So. Well, after that happened, they actually was a little kind of shocked what to do. So the dead uh, principal there. So they reported to the Central uh, Cultural Revolution Committee. No oh, problem. there's a committee? There's a Central Committee, yeah. And they said, no problem, we support your rebellion. No problem. After that, violence just really took over. Um, China. Killing is common, common space, a common place. And uh, there is a story I heard from uh, someone who witnessed it. It's, they just have the power because Mao behind them, they just make rules. Oh, first of all, I have to say, Mao abolished law enforcement. There is specific order that uh, policemen could not go to campus. They should not Forbidden, they're not allowed to go there. If on outside campus, if um, red guards hit them, they can't hit back. Hands off, abolished. Totally criminal justice system was totally abolished. Okay, now the, uh, the red, red guards could do whatever. So 20 some million people killed. The brutality is unimaginable. 
Why is they hate their teacher? Yesterday's teacher with such hatred, indoctrination. It's been decades of indoctrination. They were just, uh, then I have to go somewhere uh, to explain some, something else. That's the big division. From day one, Mao divided China, China, Chinese into two classes, red class, black class. Black class are those people who own land or property, the haves. Mm -hmm. They are the enemy of the state. About two million of them executed for just being rich. Wow. And then the red class is uh, the proletarian. They have nots. So that is actually one percent versus 99 percent, just like Bernie Sanders. Yeah. Okay. So from day one, the kids were taught, and I just remember, whoever are the black class are the enemies. They are not even human. They are, they are the ones that to be eliminated. And uh, so the hate was taught very early on. You have to understand all this and then see, I see why the, the Red Guard can turn into monsters like that. It's years of indoctrination. So they basically started to kill each other because there are factions and disagreement. And uh, that went on until um, I think 1969. By then, they already got rid of all those people in power, those ones that Mao um, thought was not loyal to him. So their job was done. What to do, do with them? They are in, like urban mobs. There's no jobs, there's no economy. What to do, do with them? Send to the countryside. Wow. That's a lesson for the leftists. You are useful idiots. When you are, you, your usefulness is over, you'll be dumped, just like the Red Guards. Yeah, by they those, got out of control. Yes, yeah, so that, that's why. Okay, so we've kind of broken down the Red Guard and this attack and split between the Red and the Black in society, and this was really the haves and the have-nots. It was based on class. Connecting that to America, we definitely see the division of class with the rise of Bernie Sanders, the Democratic Socialists, and the rest of them. They talk about class and the 99% versus the 1%, but I would say they're utilizing cultural Marxism to achieve their goals, especially. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the connection that you see here yeah. and this rise of Black Lives Matter? I mean, the group mm -hmm. calls themselves, or the co-founders call themselves trained Marxists. Yes. And I wanna know, have you seen the video of Patrice Cullers, the, the founder who called herself a trained Marxist. There's a video of her back in like 2013 before mm. they really got yes, started. I did. I did. And she says that she's honored to have her book compared to Mao's Little Red mm. Book. What do you think of that? Okay, um, I, I want to talk a little bit more of, uh, uh, of, about division. So I, I explained that Mao um, divided China into two, cam uh, two camps, okay. black class and uh, a red class. Okay, after all the uh, property were taken, uh, there was no class in China anymore. Actually, they got rid of class. So, but the revolution has to go on. You, they use class to gain power, and they need to use class to maintain power. But there's no class, so what they do? So Mao said, well, you may not have class, but as long as you think like those with uh, property before, you're a class enemy. So do you see how the transition from the actual class into thought crime? I see. So if you thought like that, then you are a class enemy. So before, the, uh, the label was landowners, rich peasants. They were the class enemy. Now they added more. Rightist. What is rightist? The people that uh, somehow uh, have a different opinion, Rightist, uh, counter-revolutionary. So they added to the category until the last one during the Cultural Revolution, intellectuals. That's a crime. Yeah, that oh. was one of those uh, labels or titles or hat that can put on people and make you 
in the uh, uh, black class. So they use that to do what? To divide people. So come back to uh, in America, um, they still use class. Yes, Bernie Sanders is a classic Marxist. He still uses the, uh, the, the original classic Marxist uh, tactic to divide people by halves and have not. That did not work very well because uh, we have this problem for them. That's called American dream, that everyone can, can come here with nothing and achieve your dream. And I came here with uh, 200 borrowed money and achieved my American dream. Okay, so that doesn't work too well, even though they're not going to give up on that. Anyone with a, a brain or half a brain could figure out the best way to divide America is by what? By race. So it is just a repackaged Marxism, communism, but this time it's by race. And look at what they did. It's exactly what Mao did. So they divide people by race because of the American history of slavery and Jim Crow. Okay, so uh, white people automatically become oppressor and uh, black become uh, oppressed. But that's, they don't stop there. Just like Mao did not stop with actual class. Now it's like, a, if you think, like a white person, you're a white supremacist. You are a racist. Doesn't matter what your race uh, uh, you, uh, uh, you are. Doesn't matter. Even if you are black, you are a racist. You are white su supremacist. And we saw this, you know, like a, um, a Larry Elder, uh, uh, Winsome Sears were called blackface of white supremacy. That's exactly what uh, Mao did. And that's for the same reason to divide people and more. Because uh, why they want to divide people? Because in order to control them, you divide them. And also to control those who dare to challenge their narrative. So in China, if you, if you have, if you, you can be penniless and court uh, a black class because you dare to not agree with them, same here. So CRT and the class in China called class struggle is exact the same thing. Just repackage it for different market. One is chi Chinese market back then, right? Now it's an American market. That's all it is. And the, reason, uh, the, uh, the purpose is exact same. Control people and intimidate those who re resist their control. Okay, and I see this, this rise of cultural Marxism, the dividing between race in America, is leading to something similar to the elimination of the four olds. Mm -hmm. You see the removal of statues, the distortion of history, the inclusion of new divisive curriculum in classrooms, mm -hmm. and even things as little as, I mean, I read a, you know, apple pie, classic American staple. Mm -hmm. I read on a more leftist magazine that uh, every aspect of apple pie is racist, right. and here's why. Yeah. It, mm. The gingham cloth that it rests on mm. is made of cotton. The mm. apples are actually from Asia. The sugar is from Haiti, where there is slavery. It's just, they're going to the most innocent cultural aspects mm -hmm. that kind of bring Americans together, and they're saying we can't do those things. Same thing with the national anthem. I mean, I, we could go on a list for mm. quite some time, and most recently, since we're filming here in Texas, there were leftists that wanted to remove the teaching of the Alamo, which is a, the, the most prominent staple of Texas history mm -hmm. because they said it was actually white settlers yeah, invading racist, Mexican yeah. land. Mm -hmm. And so bringing in that racial division once again. Um, but what's crazy to me is that most young Americans, we don't learn what the four olds were, the elimination of those. Can you explain what that was? Did you experience that? Uh, absolutely. Um, four olds is a uh, um, part of the goal for the Cultural Revolution. and. Uh, the real goal was, of course, to gain power, to gain absolute, uh, absolutely, absolute power for Mao. That's, but in the process, um, the tactics, one of the tactics is uh, uh, abolish four olds. Old tradition, old ideas, old custom, and old habit. It's, in one word, basically, it's the Chinese traditional culture that they want to get rid of. Why? Because they want to get rid of it to make room for Marxism ideology. You can't have 
Um, that's why um, that makes perfect sense for Antonio uh, Gramsci's uh, theory, is uh, if you can't destroy capitalism with class struggle, let's change tactics. Let's do it with culture. Let's get rid of the tradition, the family, the religion, Christianity. That's how you bring down capitalism. So Mao and I, there's no evidence so far that Mao uh, read Gramsci's works. But to me, it's like a, it's a natural progression. It's inevitable that communism will do this to destroy the old culture because that become an obstacle for them to in, uh, continue their uh, indoctrination. So they have to get rid of it. So how they got rid of uh, the four O's? Well, that's up to the uh, interpretation of the Red Guards. Anything old, anything old, anything foreign. And so old, like uh, Buddhism, of course, get rid of them, destroy everything. Old um, books, banned, burned. Um, so they went door to door and, uh, and read people's homes. Anything that's old clothes, old picture, Anything, because those are mobs, they decide what is old, what is foreign. Okay, so, and we all asked to go through your uh, household and find out items that should be handed in or destroyed. And we did not have anything. My mother looked high and low and, uh, and then found a bottle of uh, old uh, perfume. <sighs> That's bourgeois. That's foreign. So she handed that in. So it's like people, just a lot of, a lot of intellectuals burned their manuscript, burned their connections, a uh, collection of books, whatever, just to avoid uh, being caught. And uh, that is uh, absolutely the destruction of Chinese uh, culture. And uh, so in the, in the, in the mean, um, meanwhile, not just things and people, and in America so far, it's uh, more focused on people, cancel people, but they don't cancel people. They cancel the idea behind those people. And so that's exactly what um, the Red Guards did. And uh, so they cancel people as well. And th those are the people that they uh, got on the uh, struggle session and denounced, humiliate, beaten, tortured, and killed. And so this is exactly what's going on here. They, the postmodernism, right? They consider the foundation of this country a problem. They have to get rid of. What, what are they? Christianity, uh, our constitution, all this that made America what it is. They have to be removed, make place for Marxism. Wow. And so, what do you think we can do? to work against this? Where do you see this being fixed? I know. I am, the first time I just expose everything, people say, what do I do? I said, okay, <laughs> have to offer some kind of a solution. <laughs> well, I, I think my favorite take by you is that you have to understand this is not a quick fix. This yeah. is going to take a long time. And that's what I say too, this is gonna be decades of work yes. to rethink community at a local level education, leadership, what all of those things mean to us and our families. Yes. Um, so I have to say, first of thing, the first most important thing is to educate people. That's what I do. I committed to the mission of educating America, uh, Americans to tell them that woke is communism, is Marxism. So the first thing is to understand what we are dealing with. And, uh, and then understand, we did, this did not happen overnight. A lot of people say, God, what happened overnight? We, we have all these crazy things. No, it did not happen overnight. Take decades, just as you said. And we can trace back to pretty much the same time that when Marxism um, went to China, early 1900. And, uh, and then, in America specifically, in the 1930s, we have this group of devoted Marxists, uh, Marxists escaping Nazi persecution and come here and made America their home and the Frank School, um, and established Frank School. And 
they work tirelessly to make Marxism, um, uh, to teach Marxism and communism to the, uh, uh, to the uh, 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 college students. 1930s, and then we are uh, in 2020. That's how long it took them. It took them decades to, trans to make this transformation. And, uh, um, and people, I think, kind of forget, this is not the first time that it happened to America. We had our Cultural Revolution. It was in the 60s. And that was the counter culture. And it's a revolution. It's the same thing. It's trying to, what they're trying to do is to challenge all the uh, social norms, all the traditional cultures. They want to break free. It's liberation, right? It never stopped. It went under after the Vietnam War. It went quieter, but those people, they did not go away. They went to colleges and universities. They become the tenured professors. They have been uh, uh, committed to the same mission, convert America into a communist country. So that is a, a very important to understand. So it's not, there's no quick fix. There's absolutely no quick fix. We still have to work from uh, the lowest level, the local level, because <laughs> What happened is uh, there are just too many people that accepted Marxism to be the ideology that they follow. They are the people now teaching our children. They are the people that are running our institutions and our corporations. So the, uh, the, um, um, you, you probably heard this long march through the institutions. And uh, what is Long March? I think people probably have no idea where it's come from. It's come from Mao. In the 1930s, Mao was uh, trying to escape the encirclement uh, campaign by the nationalist government. They almost was totally wiped out, but they uh, took this Long March and uh, started in the southern China, mountain, mountainous area from China to go in the west through the Tibetan area to uh, landed in the uh, a northern town of Yan'an. And that's where they built their base and eventually succeeded in taking over China. That's Mao's Long March. The Marxists love that term. So a German Marxist used that term in the 1930s. He coined this phrase, Long March through institutions. That's exactly what they did. Little by little, through subversion, they took control. They basically took control of all our institutions, including our militaries. Have you heard lately they have this equity plan, action plan for our military? Yes. That is what we're facing today. In order to restore America, we have to be pre prepared. This is not a short battle, like a quick fix. We have to be willing to engage our own long march, long march back to the uh, uh, to restore America. Okay. So right now, most polls will show that a majority of young Americans believe socialism would be mm -hmm. better for the country mm -hmm. over economic freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about that? And does socialism work, or why doesn't it work? Okay. I think those young people, of course, were taught by their Marxist professors, and their understanding of socialism is sharing. It's not. It's not. That is the problem. That's why we need to take back our education system. Socialism is not about sharing. It's about government control, control of everything, control of uh, uh, resources, property. Basically, um, to be a socialist country, they have to destroy private ownership. So they have to take something from one person and give it to the other by what? By force. That's the only way. Or by uh, coercion. That's the only way. They do not understand. And uh, they, were t uh, they were told that uh, we have a socialist country like Norway and Sweden. They're not. They're free market countries. So 
if you ask me, why uh, socialist doesn't work for America? It will. It will work for America. It will work for everybody if you accept it, that you will be in a society that you have no control of anything. You have no control of information, and you have no control of your mind, and you have no control of your property. You have no control of your life. If you accept it, welcome to socialism. Yeah, I, I, it's a shame. And what I find so interesting, too, is that those same polls, there was one from YouGov, I think, 2020, and it said 70% of young Americans would vote for a socialist, but only 5 to 6% of that same group said they trust the government. Yeah. And so to me, that speaks very loudly to the fact that this is about information. Information. And this is about more so educating them mm -hmm. before the left gets to them. Because it's not necessarily that they're all indoctrinated communists yet mm -hmm. that want to seize the means of production. Instead, they're very Misinformation. confused and yeah. they are very lied to. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that if we got to them first, we could enlighten them to the realities. Now, it, speaking of the work that you do now, can let's leave off with how you are moving forward, what you plan to do, and is there any way we could support you and, and stay connected with you? Okay, I take this interview so seriously because uh, I think what I really, really want to talk to are the young people, are the, uh, uh, the young people, the young minds. So I think the most important thing is to save our youth. And I, I think right now what happened is uh, um, the media got some of the older people. We have a lot of woke older generations because the information they got indoctrinate them. And now the education system indoctrinate our children. So to me, to me, the most important thing is to save the children, save the youth. And that's why I think you're doing a great job to have this platform and have um, the information that targeted to the young people. We need to save them. They are the future of this country. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh, we just are really grateful that you would take the time to come share it. So thank I'm you so very glad much. you uh, invited me here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey guys, it's Morgan. Before we head out, I just want to say thank you for watching The Freedom Records. And thank you so much to American Journey Experience for letting us film here in Dallas, Texas at their vault. You guys, this place is filled with world and American history artifacts. It's fascinating to learn the details of the objects that are right behind us on set. So thank you to American Journey Experience for letting us film here. And actually, you guys can come here yourself. So go to the link in our bio to learn how you can do that and how you can get connected to this great place. Thank you.